questions. So several types listed here that have to do with macrovascular complications. We'll kind of go through them individually. One of them is cardiovascular disease. I do not think you were saying that. Hold on, let me start lecture capture. Thankfully, somebody in half hour reminded me. Now it's going. Thank you. Um, so cardiovascular disease, part of the problem with many of the same risk factors that contributed to onset of type 2 diabetes are also going to contribute separately to cardiovascular disease. So kind of a double whammy thing going on because developing diabetes is also going to make is going to multiply that because it's increasing their not so healthy levels of cholesterol, it's damaging their veins. So those things all kind of complicate together. Um, we with pretty much all of the vascular complications, same theory, our best defense is to manage glucose. So the more better we prevent hyperglycemia, the better off they are. In addition to that, we're managing blood pressure and lipid levels to help with all of these vascular complications, macro and micro. So I don't have to say it with all of them, just so you kind of know across the board, those are our goals. Um, we want to check blood pressure at every visit. We're aiming to keep their blood pressure below 140 over 90. If they're young, we want to aim even lower and go 130 over 80. Because remember, if we're dealing with younger patients, they have more and more and more years for their vascular system to get damaged. So we need an even lower goal and better control of them. We're going to check, check lipids at diagnosis and then once every one to two years, depending on what their lipid levels look like. We want to increase their physical activity. We want them to lose weight if that's indicated, not always indicated. Type twos often are overweight. Type ones typically have weight loss prior to being diagnosed. As far as we want them to make dietary modifications, and we think a lot about the sugar aspect of it, but we also want them to be increasing their omega threes, their fiber and plant-based foods, we want them to decrease their cholesterol, trans fats, and saturated fats. Lipids every two years? One to two years. Okay. We want them to stop smoking, because as we know, smoking is going to further decrease the blood supply, getting to places and decrease the perfusion, and exacerbate any of the other issues we've got going on. They may need aspirin or lipid lowering medications along with their diabetic therapy and also sometimes antihypertensives, which we'll talk about too. The next one is coronary heart disease, which you guys know is basically just cardiovascular disease. It's actually in the heart itself. Um, so basically same risk factors apply, same things that we're paying attention to. Um, cerebrovascular disease involves vascular changes in the vessels of the brain, leads to stroke. What's important to know about that is that diabetics not only have a two to four times greater risk of stroke, but they have an increased injury and higher mortality rate when they do have a stroke. So it's definitely important that we prevent that because they have a hard time um, recovering from them as well. Same things we've talked about for stroke specifically, alcohol, excessive alcohol use and tobacco use are also particularly risk factors for the stroke portion of it, stroke vascular portion. Peripheral vascular disease, same mechanisms we've been talking about, except they happen in the large peripheral vascular surgery circulation and we see a lot of this in the hospital um, the result of this at least they have impaired perfusion injuries and infections especially in the lower extremities don't heal well eventually the tissue dies and then amputations have to occur from that and furthermore like the mortality rate within the first five years after after an amputation rises greatly so preventing amputations keeps our clients healthier once they have an amputation they tend to go downhill it, which makes sense because it's going to exacerbate the physical activity issues and some other things like that. So, when we talk about exercise, um, that is one of the things that your book talks about is helping clients who post like amputation find other ways to be active and to burn calories and to work out, maybe like stationary bikes or different things that might be a better option for them when they can no longer be weight bearing. And also, they can do you know weightlifting exercises with their upper body, things like that to expand those possibilities. These clients are also going to have reduced immunity. Vascular changes combined with the hyperglycemia result in reduced immunity. Their white blood cells are going to be less active due to the changes. 
Tissues obviously are not being well nourished, and so they're susceptible to invasion by microorganisms, and infections tend to become more severe more quickly than by their clients. So it's important if they have signs of infection that they're notifying their physician. It does a lot of different things. It can mess with their glucose control to start with, so it's going to make them more susceptible to hypo and hyperglycemia, but it is also um, they're going to have trouble fighting off those local infections as well because of the poor circulation and the inability of their, the cells that need to get there can't get there because of the circulation is poor and the nutrients can't get there either. Next one, microvascular complications. So the first one on that list is nephropathy. Where does nephropathy happen? Pause up. Kidneys. Okay, so nephropathy, we're talking about the kidneys. Vascular changes in the kidneys lead to diminished kidney function, eventually often kidney failure. Sometimes clients end up on dialysis. Diabetes is the leading cause of kidney failure. Being diabetic for 10 to 15 years is a risk factor. Um, it's interesting because like we talked about the other day, the actual initial problem is the amount of volume that's going through the kidneys, basically. Because remember, we've got that osmotic, osmotic, osmotic diuretic effect of having that high glucose in the urine, pulls extra water in, ends up being more fluid than the kidneys can handle well, so causes damage within the kidneys, and then that's a vicious cycle, basically. So the kidneys get more damage, they can handle less fluid, still have the same amount of fluid coming in, and then eventually the kidneys just stop working all together because they continually get damaged. Um, in order to help prevent this, we want to control blood pressure to prevent that initial damage that's happening from the high pressure. We want to test urine albumin in annually. Control glucose also and blood pressure. And then there are a couple of specific types of blood pressure meds that have been shown to kind of have a protective effect on the kidneys. One of them is ACE inhibitors, ACE. And the other one is you can for sure do ARB, but it's angiotensin receptor blockers. And those specifically, we used to even put people on them preventatively who weren't actually hypertensive. That's not really done so much anymore, but they are, if someone needs a hypertensive, those two seem to show some particularly good effects in the kidneys of diabetics at prolonging delay that damage. So, Enid, where does neuropathy happen? Extremities. They said in the nerve. Right, so neuropathy for diabetes is in the nerves. It can be both peripheral and autonomic. So, peripherally, nerve function deteriorates, resulting in a loss of sensory function. It can involve all body parts, but lower limbs are particularly a problem for these clients. And oftentimes they will have nerve, nerve pain, like that's a stabbing, burning, tingling pain prior to total loss of sensation. And sometimes even after they don't have sensation, they will still have those neuropathic pains. Those are particularly hard to treat because they come directly like kind of through the damaged nerve. So um, can anybody think of a medicine here in Tonkwa? Lyrica, gabapentin. So a couple of different medicines we sometimes see people on in the hospital to try to help deal with that neuropathic pain for diabetic. Um, autonomic can also occur in the autonomic system. The loss of nerve stimulation, appropriate nerve stimulation, results in dysfunction and dysregulation. So it can cause problems with heart function, blood pressure control, GI issues, and things like that that are not just necessarily the, necessarily the neuropathy that we normally think about peripherally, but also kind of a more systemic issues from it. Both types are due to hyperglycemia again, vessel damage. Vessel damage leads to lack of nutrients and oxygen to the nerve. Nerves get inflamed, worsened by smoking and alcohol. So it's kind of how it happens. Um, your book talks about there can be a couple of different types, a slowly progressing type that's kind of diffuse. And it may. Yes. Do you want to slow it down just a little bit? We can do that. Where do you want me to go back to? Uh, I got lost a little bit around the autonomic. Okay, so autonomic, just think about that as more like bot systemic rather than localized um, neuropathy. And what I think what I said is it can affect things like the heart, blood pressure control, GI systems, things like that. More for that part, I'm kind of just wanting you to remember that, you know, we see the peripheral and that's what we see a lot, but it may also be causing some other dysregulation that's a little more internal and not quite, a little more mass, which is easy for us to identify. Same causes, hyperglycemia, vessel damage. So when the nerves aren't getting enough nutrients, they get damaged and don't work well anymore. And then the other piece, and you don't need to know this for the test, is just so you know that there are, it can be slowly progressive, diffuse, 
or sometimes people will have an acute sudden attack in one small focal nerve area. Um, and sometimes those acute ones will resolve if the nerve hasn't been too damaged. <coughs> the next one on your slide, I think, is retinopathy. So retinopathy, of course, deals with the eyes. Legal blindness is 25 times more common in diabetics. It's highly based on how long they've had the disorder. At 20 years, nearly all diabetics will have some sort of visual impairment. Um, let's see what else you need down here. So basically, tiny little vessels get damaged and leak, and then more hypoxia occurs. The stuff that's leaked out interferes with the vision. Um, when the body tries to compensate for that, it will grow kind of tight. It'll try to grow new vessels for the circulation, but oftentimes those aren't well formed or well developed, and so then they also start leaking and scar and things like that. And so that whole just kind of progressive process occurs. I think there's a picture later that you can see that kind of gives you an idea about these things. Um, they also get macular edema. So they need, I know you guys touched on this, but they, in some of the stuff too, they need annual eye exams. And they also need to, the better control they are when they go to visit their eye doctor, the more accurate their prescription will be. Because being hypoglycemic and hyperglycemic affect your vision. And so if they go see the doctor and they're way out of control, their prescription is not gonna be as good for their glasses and stuff. So the better control they can be when they see the doctor, the more accurately he can prescribe for them. Um, prevention is basically the same. Control glucose, control blood pressure, control lipids. Um, so this is kind of a, so what nursing implication related to diabetes can you see still are from clients who can't see very well after they've been diabetic for 15 or 20 years? Driving at night. Driving is good. This one's very specific to diabetes though. What might these people need to do that they can't see to do anymore? Insulin injection. Exactly. So, you know, you guys are, a lot of you are young, but like for those of us who are a little older, it's hard now to see the insulin syringes. So, you know, especially it can become dangerous and hard for them to read their insulin. So we'll talk more about some things, but that's always something you need to assess when you're looking at somebody who's diabetic is whether they can visually, that aspect, not just can they, in a tactile sense, administer with insulin, but can they see well enough to dose themselves with insulin. Um, next one is sexual dysfunction. Obviously, the same circulatory problems, sensory problems are also going to result in sexual issues. Um, can be erectile dysfunction in men, but not limited to just men. Women can also have decreased lubrication, pain or discomfort with intercourse, and decreases in libido. So keep that in mind because, you know, that's a major life change, too, that we have to keep in mind with this disorder. The last one is cognitive dysfunction, which makes sense. So you've got the tinier vessels within the brain besides the ones that might cause your stroke. You've got little vessels, too, that aren't getting good circulation, so that's going to cause some cognitive decline. Um, it may have an increased risk of dementia. The longer they've been diabetic, the more likely that effect is. And also depression is prevalent and more severe in this population. And that makes sense to us too when you think about what a life altering disorder this is. They need to change kind of everything about it. Their whole body feels like it's going downhill. So an emotional reaction to that makes some sense too. So types of diabetes, which you guys are probably at least somewhat familiar with already. We have type one and type two. They both share the main same feature, which is they both involve chronic hyperglycemia. And then there's a normal glucose level on this slide that is the one from your book, because you may see and read a lot of different things in a lot of different places. But if you were answering a test question, this would be the one that you would need to use, because this is the one that came from your textbook for your normal. I don't even know that there's a test question that is that. I'm just saying. Just make note of what it is in your book, in case you need it. Okay, so we'll talk a little more detail about type 1. So type 1 usually occurs in people younger than 30. There is a genetic susceptibility to it. People don't directly inherit it necessarily, but certain tissue types that will be inherited can make them more susceptible if they also have environmental triggers, if they have some of those other risk factors to go along with it. Um, it can often be caused by an autoimmune, brought on at least by an autoimmune reaction or a viral infection because it basically involves totally damaging those beta cells that produce insulin. 
It is usually an abrupt onset, where with type 2, we usually see kind of a more slow progression into it. Um, beta cells are completely destroyed, so there's an absolute insulin deficiency in these clients. These clients have to have insulin. They don't produce any insulin on their own. Unlike when you look at type 2s, they may still produce some insulin, but they're not as sensitive to it, or they're not producing enough of it. These type 1s are going to have to have insulin because they have zero way to get that, that glucose into their cells without insulin. Type 2. Type 2 can occur at any age. We generally see it in middle-aged and older adults, but as our populations become more obese at a younger age, we see more and more of it. Sometimes we're seeing it in adolescents now. Um, and the prevalence of this disorder will continue to rise as obesity rates rise. Um, we talked a little bit the other day, certain ethnic populations are more predisposed to it than others. Native Americans, Hispanics, African Americans. Um, this can be especially damaging because we also see that sometimes ethnic minorities don't get don't have as good of outcomes from a variety of disorders, and diabetes is one of those disorders. Some things that might contribute to that, and I actually think there's a slide that will write these things out for you towards the end, so you don't necessarily have to worry about writing all these things out. But um, they may have poor access to care, so they may have trouble getting the care that they need. They may have insufficient resources to maintain care. There's a lot of expense involved. So you're trying to buy the proper diet. You need strips to test with. You need to buy insulin. You need to buy syringes. You need to buy needles. You know, and so there's a lot of expense sometimes that goes along with this particular disorder. And so sometimes it's just too much for people to keep up with expense-wise. And also, they sometimes ethnic minorities have a distrust of the healthcare system, so they may not absorb the teaching that they're given as much or go back to seek more teaching when they need it. <coughs> Um, this type usually begins slowly with an insulin resistance due to obesity and physical inactivity in an adult who's genetically susceptible. So slow onset, like we said, sedentary lifestyle obesity, increase your chances. Um, insulin resistance, which basically means the insulin isn't working as well, eventually leads to decreased production by the beta cells. Um, while the beta cells are still functional, can eventually be managed by lifestyle changes and oral meds because they still have some insulin to do the work. So as long as the beta cells are still functional, they can sometimes manage without any medication. We actually had a client just yesterday in the hospital who was diabetic and he didn't have finger sticks and he didn't have any meds, but she knew he was diabetic and we ended up digging a little deeper and he had been diabetic since like, I wanna say 2009 and for like the last 10 years his hemoglobin A1C is around the fives every single time. And I'm like, I felt like for my history of diabetics, that's almost unheard of to see someone get that good of control and be able to totally do that well for a long time. But obviously it does happen. So he was somebody who had just really, really fixed his diet and increased his activity level to fix, to deal with his diabetes. So. And he was not in there for a diabetes related complication either. So. Um, where are we? And the insulin can become a necessity later as more beta cells become destroyed. So a lot of times these people can manage it, but if they don't manage well with diet and exercise, they'll eventually become insulin dependent and have to have insulin too. Um, we talked about metabolic syndrome with Mr. Baird. That's a major risk factor for diabetes. This part I don't think is on a later slide. Um, so we're looking for, as far as risk factors for that, abdominal obesity, which is waist circumference over 40 for men and over 35 for women. And these are all parts of metabolic syndrome. 35 for women, 40 for men, and 10 inches. If they're hyperglycemic, so that means they're either over 100 fasting or they're already on meds for it. Over if they are hypertensive, which this section in your book defines as being over 130, over 85, or they're lower than that, but it's because they're on medicine. That would be better. Or if they have hyperlipidemia, which is defined as triglycerides greater than 150, or they're on medicine that's keeping them on the down. Or an HDL that is less than 40 for men or less than 50 for women. So remembering HDL is a good thing. So we would like our levels to be higher in that case. Everything else we're kind of looking at keeping it below something. With HDL, we want to keep it above something. And the numbers, again, are less than 40 for men and less than 50 for women. Yeah, 40 for men, 50 for women. Do what? 
age 12 baby seven. So all those factors increase diabetic risk. Once again, kind of a double way because those things are also going to increase the rate of their vascular damage if any of those things are true for them. So, question. Where am I at? Tom Claw, this is for you. It's on the slide. <coughs> D. D is your best response. That's the one that is true. Okay, so looking at the nursing process, now we have kind of the background. Some of this is going to repeat a little bit from what we just talked about and from um, some of our conversations on Tuesday. Here's the stuff we're looking for. And I think this is on, I have 1287 written down. A lot of it is on 1287. And I'm going to move to a different slide because some of it's also on this slide, so you don't have to write so much. So if you could flip like two slides forward to screening criteria, a lot of it's already written down for you. Um, age greater than 45. So these are the people we're going to screen. If their age is greater than 45, if they are obese, if their BMI is greater than 25, slightly lower if they're Asian American, and they also have any of the following. They have a first degree relative that is diabetic. They belong to a high risk ethnic group. They have a low HDL or a high triglyceride, which kind of goes back to those metabolic syndrome things we looked at. They have had a previous A1C that was more than 5.7. So an A1C of, 5 point, of above 5.7, like in the um, upper fives, lower sixes, is not diagnostic, but if they're that high, we want to keep rescreening them. They're physically inactive. They ever had a baby that was more than nine pounds or had gestational diabetes. Does anybody know why that is? Yeah, it increases your risk. So somebody, yeah, somebody who's had a big baby or has previously had gestational diabetes is at a higher risk for developing diabetes later in life. So um, if they're hypertensive, that's another risk factor, or if they some, have some kind of history of vascular disease. So this is when you would test them. If they are negative, you want to test them again in three years if they still have those same risk factors. I think we kind of covered everything there. You also want to test sooner if they're having weight changes, changes in their immunity, like they're getting a lot of infections, infections we'll talk about later. Because you've got that extra kind of glucose going on in lots of places and you've got decreased immunity, women will sometimes get a lot of yeast infections or somebody will get a lot of urinary tract infections or they'll be having trouble with infections on their lower extremities and that may be our clue that it's time to test them too. If Immunity is one, weight changes is one, so if they're having, like I said, weight loss or some weight gain, that may change the risk. Also, if they're having changes in vision or tactile sensation, because that would go along with the retinopathy or the neuropathy. Those would be other reasons that you might decide to test them sooner. Now this says, I think we're trying to increase weight, can be tied to a risk of type two, sudden weight loss can indicate type one. Talked about that. Okay, I already covered things on that, so I'm gonna wait, let me put it back and make sure we got through. Yes, so that part, that last part, the immunity vision said was on that first slide that was a couple back too. So, we know we wanna test them, how are we gonna test them? Um, we can do a fasting glucose. In order to be fasting, they are no calories for eight hours. If we get a result greater than 126 twice, that is diagnostic for diabetes. So if we get one, one of them that's higher than 126, we're gonna test again. Um, if they're greater than 100, but still less than 126, that indicates some kind of impairment and insulin insensitivity. So we would keep testing them more regularly in that case. A1C is the next one, and um, it is non-fasting. We talked about it a little bit the other day. It gives info based on the past 120 days. It is usually our best gauge of where they really are in terms of their glucose control. Pre-diagnostically, as the slide refers to, but then also we use it to kind of see how people are managing their disorder, especially after they change medication and there's some other factor changes. We can check this and kind of see how they're doing. Um, so result greater than 6.5% is diagnostic. This one we don't necessarily have to repeat because we're getting a better law. Get that in a single result. Um, that's that good. The monitoring post compliance. There is a table in your 
book, it's 64 it's on page 1289. It gives you kind of a correlation between an A1C value and what that average glucose is for that indicated value. So it will show you like if there are six, this is where their average has been. If there are seven, this is where their average has been. I don't care about you memorizing every part of that table, but you do need to know what value would be a good management level for them and what value would indicate some things need to change. Typically, if there are um, if they can keep it under 6.5, that's that's a fairly good goal. Sometimes seven, depending on your client, the goal is a little bit individualized. If you're getting A1Cs back that are over eight, then something needs to change. Their diet needs to change, their medication management, something about their situation needs to be changing if they're coming back over eight, because you're not you're not getting the glycemic control that you need to prevent long-term complications. Next one is glucose tolerance test. I know we're not really going to talk about that because it's used basically during gestational testing, and you guys are going to cover that next semester. So we're going to just just say you know it exists. You don't have to know much about it. Um, the other thing that it indicates in your book is a casual non-fasting glucose. So if they are non-fasting but they're regularly running over 200, then that can also be a problem. Typically, I don't think people are fully diagnosed with that. That just might be an indication that you want to continue with some diagnostic testing for them. Um, and then there's some other tests in your book that can help determine the type of diabetes once they're diagnosed if you need them, but not things you need to memorize for this level. We talked about screening already. So your nursing priorities focus on helping the client with diabetes achieve and maintain lifestyle changes that prevent long-term complications by keeping, this slide says blood pressure, then glucose, then cholesterol. I would probably change that order to glucose being your first, and I typed it, so it's not saying it was my mistake, but <laughs> by keeping blood glucose as your highest priority, followed by blood pressure and then cholesterol levels as close to normal as possible. The other thing I thought about when I was, I know that, um, you guys know what DM stands for, that means diabetes mellitus, so same thing as saying diabetes, basically we use that abbreviation there. So that was a man, and I thought, oh yeah, I talked about that. And we talked about the other day, the other note I have on this slide is you know that you really need to teach your clients the importance of glycemic control because some of them are going to feel better running high, but that's not a place that you need to be long term, it's not healthy for them. So teach them about why it's important because they may be like, well, I feel better when I run up here, but they need to understand the long term complications, you know, of that decision. So what are our priorities? We want to detect early. That's often our priority in nursing, right? Is finding these people early because we can limit the damage. The sooner we find them, the sooner we're managing them. We want to regulate our glucose after that. Good goals include an A1C below seven and the pre-meal finger state blood sugar of 70 to 130. So if someone's well-managed, those are the indications we're gonna see in evaluating their management. <coughs> Long-term goal, obviously, is the prevention of complications. So these give us some short-term planning things, but really what our ultimate goal is, A, is to prevent acute complications and then also long-term complications. How do we do that? So this is kind of, there's a lot on this slide. We're not going to go into a lot of detail on, on this slide, but we'll talk about them as we go further. Um, so it's very much a team approach with diabetes. You need dietary, you need pharmacy, you may need physical therapy to help them find some activity that they can enjoy and that they can do, especially if they're starting out from a very sedentary situation. We're gonna use medications, glucose monitoring, nutrition, exercise, smoking cessation. In addition to stopping smoking, they need to understand the influence of alcohol, which I think somebody touched on on Tuesday, and we'll talk about more too. Blood pressure needs to be controlled. Lipids need to be controlled. We need to teach them. There is a ton, a ton, a ton of teaching that goes along with diabetes because that daily self-management is kind of the most important comp component. We can't do this for them, basically. We can put them on medicines, but if they're not watching their diet, those medicines are not gonna be enough, so. Um, and then transplant can be an option for a select group of people, um, provide that finds a good candidate. That would probably be more of a type one option for somebody who has, you know, who is young and has lost baby cell function and somebody in the later stages where they're not sensitive to the insulin anymore. So replacing their pancreas and giving them insulin would help if they're not sensitive to it anymore. Meds. So, like I just said, meds are not, in diabetes, meds are not a substitute for nutritional and activity changes. Um, insulin is going to be needed by everyone who is a type 1, um, and some type 2s. Oral meds are basically only going to work on type 2s. Typically, and I don't know, this may be on the other slide. Let's see. I feel like there might be, a, well, we'll talk about it now, and then we can see it later if we find it. 
generally speaking, what they're going to do is, um, if they're type 2, they're going to try first, unless they, they come in just really, really in that shape, they're going to try first to manage them with oral medications, take one medicine, titrate it up. If that doesn't work, add a second type of medicine, titrate that up. If we get to the point where they're on two or three oral meds and that's still not working, then we're going to start insulin for them, even if they're type 2. Like we said, type 1 is going to have to start insulin immediately because that's going to be the only, they don't have any insulin for us to work with otherwise if we don't put it in. And also that can change over time as people age. Like, you know, they may start out only needing diet and exercise, and then as they get older and their condition continues to change, they may need to add insulin somewhere along the way. So insulin is a big deal, right? We have to have people double check it for us because it's in small amounts. It makes a big difference. And so there's a lot of teaching, learning for us, and teaching for the client that goes along with insulin. There are a lot of pieces to that. Um, insulin is generally administered by injection. I think your book talks about like a rapid acting powder is kind of the only other option that I've seen. You also can do some pumps, which we'll talk about. There are four types, and the next few slides will look at these individually. There is rapid acting, short acting, intermediate acting, and long acting. Um, some of those can be mixed in one syringe, some can't. The best plan as far as even insulin is to mimic the body as much as we can. So we're trying to get kind of a basal level initially, like a baseline level, and then we will use, you see this in the hospital, we use sliding scale to kind of adjust for food spikes. So that's kind of, because that's basically the way the body works. It's releasing an amount of insulin all the time and then adjusting when intake changes. And so we're kind of, that's what we're trying to do is mimic the body as best we can. And that also adds some better flexibility than if we just give them one large dose. We give them a, one big dose of insulin and then they can't eat because they get sick later that day or, you know, different things like that. It's hard for us to manage those things. Um, or they eat a large meal and they eat more and we're not paying attention to it. So sometimes that multiple doses in the day is better. Um, we already talked about infusion pumps and things that are on that. Um, <laughs> slide. Okay, so first is rapid acting. Um, as we look through these insulins, um, oh, I forgot to talk to you guys about those work guides and the crossword puzzle. The, the little things that were at the back of the work guide, the handout about insulin, you can look at that if it's helpful to you. It has different time frames than what your textbook does, so go with your textbook and the slides in terms of learning time frames. So don't try to learn the time frames in both because it's going to confuse you because they're not the same. So look at the slides for time frames. It is, a lot of times we say don't memorize things, but it is important that you guys know these because basically if you're going to give a dose of insulin, you need to know when it's going to start working, when it's going to peak, so they shouldn't be exercising, or they might need to snack at the peak, and how long it's going to last. So on each of these, you are going to kind of have to know those things. Um, so rapid. Onset is 15 to 20 minutes. Peak is one to three hours. Lasts for three to five, and it gives you the, the brand names down there. And this is in a later slide too. Another thing to know about insulin is most of the time with clients, we don't care like whether you take the generic or you take this brand or you take that brand and it's all the same medicine. Like we don't care if you take Tylenol or if you take acetaminophen, insulin is different than that. The brands do vary in insulin. So if they're using a certain brand, they need to stick with that brand or notify their provider before they try to change to a different brand. So just kind of keep that in mind too, which we do typically switch from the hospital because the hospital is only going to carry one brand of kind of each kind. But just be aware of that's a thing that you need to educate your clients about. So in theory, you want to give this this about this type of insulin about 10 minutes before a meal. It's a little more complicated in a facility, depending on how consistent your meal trays are. So that's kind of something you'll have to learn for yourself in your own facility. Um, if you work in a facility where meal trays come at the right time every single meal, every single day, then you might feel comfortable giving that insulin early. As a nurse, I'm a little bit uncomfortable sometimes with giving that insulin unless I can physically see the trays on the floor. Now, if you gave it and something happened in the trade didn't come, you could get them a snack or something, but just kind of keep that in mind depending on your facility and how reliable your meal times are. So when we say this, that's, you know, textbook utopia, we want to give it 10 minutes early. Real life is, you know, that's only if you know your food's going to show up when it's supposed to show up. A little, you know, and true at their house, too. I mean, they, they need to get, have consistent meal times at home for this reason, so they know when to dose their medicines, too. Um, this one should be clear, and if you're mixing it with another insulin, like an intermediate acting, you need to draw this one up first. It should be clear, and if you're mixing it with another one, with like an intermediate or something, you draw this one up first, the rapid acting first. <coughs> Next one is short acting. So its onset is in 30 minutes. 
peaks in two to five hours. Duration can be five to 12 hours. So it's gonna depend a little bit on the brand. This one is regular, and then it shows you the brand names for regular insulin there. Um, it is designed to be given 20 to 30 minutes before a meal, so it has a little longer lead time before the meal. Same cautions as before. You gotta know what time your trays are gonna be there. Um, in general, this is the one that you're gonna draw up before others but it should not be mixed unless it's specifically, specifically prescribed that you, should, you can mix it. So unless you're specifically told to mix it, don't mix this one. You can mix it, but only if it's prescribed that way. There's some others you can't mix at all. And in theory, they won't be prescribed that way. But. What? Yeah, you would draw it up first. Um, intermediate acting is our next one. This one is MPH. This is the only one that we're going to talk about that's cloudy. So it is normally cloudy because we're going to talk about teaching our patients to inspect their insulin before they give it. The ones that are supposed to be clear, like all the other ones, if it's cloudy, you don't want them to use it. But in this case, it will actually just be cloudy. And so as long as it's consistently cloudy and they don't see like particles or you know like as long as they can you know roll them in their hands to mix it and it ends up being uniformly the same then it's fine but if it has you know if it's not mixing well then they would still need to get rid of this one too okay. um once again you don't mix it unless it's specifically per prescribed but if you are mixing it um you want to draw the other one up first the okay. short acting yes um, so is the short acting insulin clear then as well that what you said? yes okay. Okay. yeah i have a question too one more question. Okay. Okay, so the rapid acting you draw first and the short acting you draw first? Well, you're probably not gonna draw them both. I realize that's confusing, but the point is that you're gonna draw those before the intermediate if you're mixing with intermediate. Okay. <coughs> Which one do you not mix? You don't, you don't make short acting. Okay. You draw them both up first if you're going to mix them with intermediate. Yeah, if you're going to, right, that's a good explanation. You would draw either, it would probably only be one of those with the intermediate, so you draw that one up first and then the intermediate. Yeah, and I don't know, on rapid, one more question. On rapid acting, you don't have to um, have specifically told to mix it, you can mix that one. Those both say to only mix them if they're prescribed to be mixed. As far as textbook utopia. Okay, so on intermediate, that is typical, that is NPH, is kind of the short term. Then you've got some um, brand names there. I don't know if we went through this slide, but Onset's one to four hours. Peak is four to 14. Can last for between 10 and 24 plus hours. There's some other mixes that are also considered intermediate. And if you want more info, there's a chart on page 1295 in your book, but you don't need to memorize it for the test. But this, this part you need to memorize, but you don't have to like know the whole chart, but you need to kind of know those time frames for each category. The time frames that are on the slides for each category. So you know, a an onset time frame and a peak time frame, the duration time frame. I would think so. I think so. That's what she said. Yeah, I was getting ready to say that. Yeah, ideally you want to give this one 30 minutes before a meal. What did you say? It just depends on how they're prescribed to them. Generally not at the same like time, like at the same injection time. Um, this one acts more as kind of like basal insulin, but it does give some morning, some meal coverage since the morning dose kind of is peaking during lunch and supper. So it will kind of help cover those meals, but it gives them kind of a continuous since it's longer acting. Then we get to long acting, considered an immediate. For this one, it's split out between the two different kinds because they were so different, it was hard to combine the two into one time frame that was reasonable. So um, you do not mix these with any other insulin. These are designed to provide that baseline basal coverage, so you're giving those unrelated to intake. Typically, it's going to be at supper or at bedtime and once a day. Sometimes we'll add a second dose in the morning. But these, these are long acting. So, as you see, if you look at the duration, they should both, they can both provide up to 24 hours of coverage for once daily dosing. Yes, usually like supper or bedtime is when you're going to give, like, if, they're, if they're on once daily dosing. So you can see the onsets. 
Lagrin is two to four hours. The other one's one hour. There is no peak necessarily for Lagrin. The other one is six to eight, and then 24 hour duration. So, teaching about insulin. There's a lot to this. So, first piece we touched on a little bit in order for clients to self administer, they're going to have to have the physical dexterity to drop the insulin, the cognitive ability to remember the dosage and timing and the visual acuity to read the tiny numbers on the syringe. So obviously with older adults, those could all be major issues that you need to assess before you're sending somebody home on insulin. We'll talk about this later too. Another piece that comes into it is they, you know, if their glucose gets too low, mild hypoglycemia, they're gonna be able to handle themselves. But if they're really low, they're gonna to have to have somebody else handle that for them because they're gonna to be too low to think clearly and take care of themselves. So I even actually heard a nurse in the hospital asking, you know, is your daughter gonna be there if, you know, your blood sugar gets too low to help you? So keep that in mind too, that they have kind of some kind of support system for if they get hypoglycemic in a plan. And we'll talk about some other things like, and some of these we touched on Tuesday, like always carrying a snack with them so that they can react quickly when they recognize the signs of hypoglycemia and having a medical alert for them on and things like that. Develop a plan with the family because hypoglycemia happens, you know, even with our best attempts to prevent it. Sometimes it happens because some of those things can be brought on by illness and other things like that that you can't prevent. So to make sure they kind of have a plan in place. Storage. So insulin stays potent the best if it's stored between 36 and 86 degrees Fahrenheit. If it is not shaken excessively and if we keep it away from direct heat and light. So that those are the things that are the keys to maintaining potency. So it should never be frozen. We don't want them to shake it to mix it. We want to teach them to roll the bottle between their hands to mix it. Anything that is unopened supply should be kept in the fridge because that's going to help maintain its potency longer until it's opened. 36 to 86. And that's Fahrenheit. 36, 86. Now, Glargan, once again, like we said, it's the one that can't be mixed with anything. It also requires refrigeration all the time. Everything but Glargan, when they open a bottle, like the bottle they're currently using out of, they can keep it out of the fridge for 28 days. So they can keep it on their counter for 28 days and use out of that bottle. At the end of 28 days, if that bottle's not gone, then you throw it away, even if it's half full. And once again, really got to teach this stuff because it's an expensive disorder to have and they're going to be tempted to lie to on it. So I don't want to throw away half a bottle of perfectly good insulin. But they need to understand that if it's been out for 28 days, so they need to write on it too when they open it so they know what day they got it out. If it's a pre-filled syringe, those are good for 30 days instead. Let's just throw it in the trash. Um, the other thing about pre-filled syringes is they need to be stored with their needle pointed upward or flat so that the little particles of insulin aren't going to clog up the needle. So if you think about like when you're rolling the bottle to mix that up, if, all, if they're stored needle down and all the sediment is going to the bottom of the needle, then the needles can get clogged. So teach them how to store if they're using pre-filled. They can keep those out for 30 days, and or they're good for 30 days once they're filled, and they have to be stored with their needle up or laying on the flat. We talked about roll rather than shake your bottles or your pre-filled syringes. Visually inspect your insulin. Anything that's precipitated, clumpy, or has a change in clarity should be discarded. Talked about the MPH will normally be cloudy throughout, and consistently cloudy. Everything else should still be clear. Syringes. They should only give insulin with insulin syringes. So you have to educate them about that. Insulin syringes are marked in units and not in mils. If you've given those in the hospital, you probably have noticed that before. Clients should try to buy the same type of syringe every time, like stick with the same brand, simply because it's going to reduce the chance of them making an error when they dose themselves, if it's the exact same syringe every time. For the most part, those things are all going to be single use and should be properly disposed of after use. They will need a way to dispose of them. They can use sharp containers, but sharps containers tend to get expensive and disposing of them is difficult. So what a lot of people use is maybe like an empty plastic like liquid detergent bottle to throw their syringes in at home and then dispose of that. But they need to be storing them some things so that other in some things so other people don't get stuck. Or so they don't get stuck themselves. But if they're using a pen type injector device, be sure they know how to position it to properly read the dosage window. So they need to know which position to read it in. 
And another thing to know is that, and then this seems kind of counterintuitive because you think, well, if they can't see their insulin screens, they could just yeah. use the pre-filled pens, but those are actually not licensed for use with visually impaired people because you still have to be able to read the tiny little dosage numbers to get the right dosage. They need to know how to monitor and need to know about meal times. So they're gonna self-monitor glucose levels routinely, but then they're also gonna to need to know to monitor extra when their meds are being adjusted, both diabetic meds and other meds, because other medications like steroids can affect their glycemic control. They need to know the signs and symptoms of hypo and hyperglycemia, which we'll go over in more detail later. They need to especially monitor during times of illness and then before and after exercise. Be sure your client knows how to use whatever meter they have chosen to get, that they know how the strips go in, they know how to use it properly. Most of the time we're getting an accurate readings, it's not the meter, it's the person who's using the meter. So be sure to let you know. Remember you're teaching things, have them teach it back to you. If you've got that meter available and they can show you how they would do it, have them show you how they would do it. Things that can result in errors in inaccurate readings are client error, obviously. If the machine's not being properly calibrated, if they're not getting sufficient blood, because sometimes you have that, te that temptation to squeeze or milk the blood out of the finger, but you're not really getting a good sample when you have to squeeze and milk it like that, because you're getting, it's throwing off your reading. Um, that your test strips are being properly stored and they aren't expired, and that when we use a new ball test strips, it gets properly matched, coded to the machine. You get extra serous fluid in it instead of like actual blood when you squeeze it out like that. And it causes tissue damage, which can also change the levels of your squeeze on. Um, there are a couple of phenomenons with diabetics. I'm trying to see if that's, it's, this is kind of along with blood glucose monitoring, but, and I'm not super worried about knowing these for the test, but there are a couple of phenomena that can cause morning hypoglycemia, like even before they've eaten. And just the names of those are non-phenomenon. And then the other one is Somogy, S-O-M-O-G-Y-I. Both of those can be managed by adjusting insulin dosages and timing and adding a bedtime snack because basically it's involving the body overreacting to high glucose during the night and then producing too much, you know, overcorrecting for it so they're hypoglycemic in the morning. Just FYI, so you know those words if you ever hear them. You don't have to memorize them for me. Adjustments. Be sure to client your ca ca caution your client against adjusting their own insulin schedule. They need to consult a provider. Changes are needed in their insulin dosages unless they've been given some specific parameters from the provider, but you don't want them to just decide they're running too high or too low and start adjusting their own dosages themselves. Also, they shouldn't change between rates and insulin. We talked about that. Obviously, you need to make sure that they know how to properly administer their insulin. There is, on 1295, figure 64.3 gives you kind of a refresher pick about subcutaneous sites. Can you read it off again? Okay. Um, overall, you're looking for fatty areas is where you're, so that you get a good fat layer to put that sub-Q shot in. Um, your book advises against rotation. Your book encourages your clients to rotate within a single site rather than between sites, which in the past I feel like we've encouraged people to rotate between sites, but basically what it's saying is there's a difference in absorption rate between different sites. So if they'll stick within rotating the exact site within an area, they'll get better consistency of absorption of their insulin. So. And the um, abdomen, particularly, is the fastest absorption and gives the most consistency. So we encourage them maybe to use that. So Mr. Page, like if they use the thighs, they should stick to the thighs. If they use the abdomen, they should stick to the abdomen. And the abdomen. That's kind of yeah. That's kind of what the book says, which is not the way I feel like we were taught way back when. Yeah. <laughs> but I, I I understand the rationale. It makes sense to me, but I just wanted to make sure that they were. No, me too. That was kind of new to me too. Yeah, because but that's what it's saying is that switching heights makes too much variability in it. So, um, and then there is a box, and I'm not saying you have to memorize this, but definitely look at it. That also, and it may be that same box we talked about that gives the client specific instructions for administration. Kind of tells you step by step what you would teach your client. That one that's on 1297 Am I right? I don't have my book open. Okay, I was like it's in my notes that way, but I'm not holding the book. Okay, so. Insulin pumps, and this is probably not the most recent picture of them, but insulin pumps are small computerized devices that deliver insulin in two ways. They give you that steady, major, <laughs> continuous dose, and then you can also program them to give you a bolus at your direction around the time that you eat. So it gives you kind of a little bit more, can better sometimes mimic the way the body does things, and you're not having to take a shot every single time. 
Um, they can get infected, so you plants need to know how to properly clean their site and how to change their infusion set, which they're typically going to have to do every few days. There can also be a greater risk of ketoacidosis with these. So, and we'll talk about checking for urine ketones, but it talks a little bit about that um, you get ketones in your urine when your blood, blood sugar gets high sometimes, and so they need to check for those if the blood sugar is over 300. They also need to have a backup supply of insulin and syringes just in case the pump malfunctions. Because think about that if it's late at night, it's on the weekend, the pump malfunctions, and they've got nothing, then they can get really, really sick. So, it's good for them to have a backup plan just in case. And this is similar to what we already talked about. General principles for oral meds, because we're going to move into oral meds now. These are indicated, oh, it's about break time. I was talking and not paying attention. <laughs> indicated with when control is not achieved with nutrition, exercise, and stress management. So we don't want to jump on them. If we can control them without them, that's what we want to do. Start at the lowest effective dose, titrate them up. If we get to the max on the first one, add a second one with a different mechanism of action. And then when we get two or three of them, if we're still not controlled, we're going to move to answer. Let's, okay, so um, looking, I'm going to switch to the next slide, but then we're going to get into oral meds, which is going to take us a little while. So let's take a break for about 10 minutes. So it's 122 here now, so 132.